All right. Hey, welcome back to the group project podcast episode number 40. I have none other than the Dr. Todd Whitaker here with me today. Uh, do you care if I call you Todd? Is that okay? Or as long as the T and V is a small letter, not capitalized, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> yes. You can uh, call me whatever you want to. Awesome, Todd. Well, thank you so much. Um, most of you are going to know who Todd is. Uh, educator, writer, motivational speaker, ed consultant, professor, you do it all. Um, you, you know, we're going to talk a lot about your books. You've written, I believe, over 50, over 50 books. Is that is that the updated number? Or are we higher than that now? Um, I don't know. It's pretty close to 60, but I, I, I used to keep track and I've kind of lost count. So now I don't, I don't really know. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be anything by saying that it's just true. I don't know. Sure. Sure. It's somewhere well, around there. Like I've always said two of them are good and the rest aren't. So you have to figure out which two it is. So that's, cool. that's your task. Jared. Well, shoot. That's good. That was going to be kind of one of my questions later. So um, I, maybe I'll be guessing or I guess we'll see later, but the one, you know, the one that probably the one that people know the best uh, was a national bestseller, uh, What Great Teachers Do Differently. Um, and, and I believe that sold, what, over 500,000 copies. Um, and altogether, and again, you, you're not in your head, you know these things, but um, altogether, all your books, over one, well over 1. 1.5 million copies, maybe it's a couple million, which is just, just impressive. Uh, so, Todd, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little nervous here meeting with you today. You've been one of my idols uh, for for a number of years. Well, I'm uh, nervous meeting with you, Jared. So, we'll, it'll all balance out. How does that sound? <laughs> uh, that sounds good. Um, okay. uh, so, I, I kind of mentioned before the show um, what what got me introduced to you was. Um, 2000, I want to say 2013, um, was an assistant principal and our, um, was in a larger district in the Waterloo community school district here in Iowa. And our assistant superintendent handed me this book. Well, actually handed all the admins a book, um, and said, Hey, I want you to want you to read this. We're going to do a book study. And, um, at the time, uh, I was not a, I was not a lifelong learner. Let's just say that I could care less about reading, but he, he handed us one of your books, Todd, which was what great principles do differently. And I reluctantly opened, opened the books, opened the pages and, you know, two, three, four chapters in, man, I was, I was hooked. Uh, just, it was for the first time as a, as a educational leader, a book just really, really spoke to me. It's like, this is what I've been needing to hear <laughs> um, at, being a few years into administration. So, um, and so ever since I've just, I've just enjoyed your books. And now that I've started this podcast, I, um, I uh, just kind of did a cold email out to you. said, would you mind meeting with me? And um, I'm just very thankful to have you, have you here tonight. Um, I'm honored. So, let me get into it. You know, a lot of people know you as, as speaker, author, Todd Whitaker. Um, you've probably gone over this numerous times, but what is, uh, you, maybe just give us a quick history of, of where you were at before you got to where we know you at as what you're doing right now. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm from St. Louis area. Uh, went to University of Missouri where I happen to work now and um, was a business educa business major, not business education, business. Graduated in business, got in law school, and happened to become involved with a, the third winningest basketball coach in Missouri high school history. And I thought, you know, I really want to make a difference, so I want to get into education. So I uh, quit law school and got into education and um, started teaching in Keatsville. I was a math teacher, basketball coach. And then at 25, I was a uh, High, uh, high school principal and varsity boys and varsity girls basketball coach. And I told somebody earlier today, I set a school record for wins, which I still have because no one talls moved into the community. And um, if I can just keep them out, I'm going to be having that record for a long time. <laughs> how and, many wins? Um, how many wins was it? Uh, oh, well, it's a first team. That's the only team they've ever had to win 20 games. Wow. Okay. Uh, it's a tiny, 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 tiny school. Let me tell you. Okay. Um, graduating classes were in the teens. Wow. Yes. So you, and, had some, uh, you had some height then that helped you out. Uh, we had a pretty good team and one, one good team and we had one cheerleader and, <laughs> um, 
Uh, so anyhow, then I went to move to Jefferson City, Missouri, and I was a principal. I was an administrator there for seven years, opened up two new middle schools. And all of my moves have been all exactly the same thing. It was just, how do you make a difference? Can you make a bigger difference? Can you make a bigger difference? And not a more important difference, but just a bigger one. And that's how come I got into uh, uh, education leadership at the university position. And also I was invited to present a lot when I was a principal. My wife was as much or more than I was too. And, and uh, we, our superintendent let us go anywhere. We just felt guilty, you know, leaving because then all of a sudden now the assistant principals are handling lunch duty and the school has, you know, 1300 kids. And, um, and so our, our children were two and four and we felt like it was now or 20 years from now. And um, so moved to Indiana State and were there for a long time. And then my, ironically, my girls both ended up back in Missouri, coincidentally, teaching. And my son was, is in New York City. And so we thought, what the heck, and moved back in University of Missouri. My wife's actually in charge of the principal superintendent preparation program at Mizzou. And uh, she's a former Blue Ribbon principal, went to the White House and all that stuff. And I'm kind of a part-time nobody. And um, works out well. Enjoy it very much. And I'm a Mizzou sports fan, so that's kind of neat, too. Yeah. Now, uh, I, okay. So, so I, I'm more of a big 10, you know, up here in Iowa, big 10, uh, country, obviously Missouri had a really tight, tight game with Arkansas a week or two ago. Is that correct? I was on Saturday. Yeah. Who won that? I, I, and I'm not playing dumb here. Who won that game? I don't. Well, I can tell you with 43 seconds left, Arkansas was down one and went for a two point conversion, threw it to a Missouri player, hit him in the chest, bounced up in the air. Arkansas caught it. And then Missouri drove down and kicked a field goal on the last nice. second. So the good guys won. Okay, nice. You, yes, are you, what do you, you got a new coach there? What are you thinking about uh, new coach? So far, so good? Or he's, I, I, you know what's really funny? He's the most intelligent coach I've ever heard uh, do interviews. It's really interesting. So we'll, I mean, we've been very good. We've won five out of the last yeah. six. You know, we're, we're playing only conference games and we're uh, five and three uh, with two games left. That So, I will say, and it's it, recruiting has already been higher than the level we've had. And, Absolutely. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's really funny because I'm a, I'm different than other people. I'm a loyal guy. So if the team's losing, I'm just as interested as if they're winning. <laughs> and most people aren't like that. And it's because I coach, I actually work with a lot of coaches, which is strange. And I always say, the, I tell other people that are fans of stuff. I said, the reason coaching is so hard is the other team wants to win too. And if they didn't want to win, coaching would be so easy, <laughs> uh -huh. but instead they want to win. And I actually am kind of an, I like the kind of underdog. So it would be easier for me to root for a program like Mizzou than it would be to root for like Alabama in which everybody's ticked off because they didn't win by enough. Absolutely. And um, so it's fun. Our basketball coach is unbelievably proud representative of the, uh, for the university, they both have been very involved in some of the social justice initiatives and awesome. and kind of leaders in the country, and um, they're just great role models. And I'm I'm that makes it fun, and uh, the basketball team's undefeated, which also makes it fun. And uh, but um, like I said, I'm just a fan. At Indiana State, I was I had five front row tickets for 20 years, and many times. There weren't many people in the second, third, or fourth rows, let me tell you. So well, just, I fly with the team, and that was fun. I've been to Iowa a lot because I've been up to Drake and Northern Iowa sure, with the yeah. team, and so I enjoyed it. Well, I just – following you on Twitter for a number of years, you've always been a huge vocal – very vocal uh, supporter of um, of the of the universities that you work with and, and the athletic programs. Um, let's, I wanted to ask you – I want to take you back. You know, you mentioned 25 years old, high school principal – what was the 25 year old high school principal Todd Whitaker like? Like, just give us a little bit of you're you're great at telling stories and just kind of just maybe fill us in on what that looked like. I don't know. I'm sure I still had acne. Um, <laughs> you know, it's really funny. It's that really was a real key for me because I just went by my instincts. And I can tell you where this all started. When I was a teacher, I was in Keatsville, Missouri. If you haven't heard of it, it's a suburb of Brunswick. And that's a joke in Brunswick. And anyhow, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine as a teacher. I teach by personality. Other teachers have lesson plans and stuff, but I just taught by personality. I was a math teacher and basketball coach. And I got along, I think, okay. 
And it was funny because I would be walking down the hallway and there'd be kids that I either had in class or was on the, or on the basketball team sitting in the hallway for punishment. And I can remember thinking, if you, meaning just in general, if a teacher can't handle these kids, their life has to be miserable. It has to be miserable. And I thought if somebody could do something to either improve the skills of the teachers or bring in better teachers, that would be more of an impact on the school than anything I could do in my own classroom or in the basketball court. And that's really where that came from. And, and I've always felt like we make all decisions based on the best people. And if you do, you never make a wrong decision. And, and I just thought everybody did this stuff. I, I truly did. I thought nothing of it. I, I, I just assumed everybody does it exactly the same way. And, um, you know, I tell a story and it's true, relying on your best teachers. I'm a principal, I've been a principal maybe two weeks, you know, I don't know, and a kid gets sent to the office. And I didn't know what to do. I'd never sent a kid to the office. I never even thought about a kid getting sent to the office, which is weird because when I was in school, I got sent to the office all the time. And um, anyhow, a kid gets sent to the office and I thought, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I went to the best teacher in the school. Her name was Jerry Murphy. It's a female, Jerry Murphy. And I go, Jerry, a kid just got sent to the office. What do I do? She said, well, the first thing to do is treat it if it's a big deal because it's a big deal to the teacher, even if it's a stupid deal. The second thing is always beat the kid home first. So get a hold of the parent and get a hold of the parent before the kid gets a hold of the parent. And you know, the phone's your best friend unless it's ringing. The third thing is have a, a consequence, even if it's sit there 10 minutes. What does that even mean? Sit there 10 minutes and the kid goes, what? You know, I mean, and the fourth thing is get back with the teacher personally in person and tell them exactly what you did so that they feel supported. Now, Jared, what do you think of that advice? Pretty good advice, isn't it? That's pretty darn good advice. You'd like to your print current principals to have it if they're 50 years old. And what happened is I realized my best teachers are the only people in the school that always want me to succeed. Average teachers don't always want the principals to succeed. Some, a lot of times they do. And then you have some people that are always hoping the leader fails. The same way with the superintendent. And I'm not being critical, Jared. It's, that's not a criticism. Your best teachers, though, know if you're not successful, they can't be as successful. And so I realized, and, and the best people aren't part of the rumor mill. So she's not running and telling other people. You know, I compare it, and this is funny, I compare it to if in high school, if I could have asked somebody out for a date and they told me no, but they wouldn't tell anyone else they told me no, I'd ask everybody out. <laughs> Because I didn't mind them thinking poorly of me. I just didn't want the whole school thinking poorly of Good me. Good point. Good point. And you're, but your best, you know, and if you think about that, if somebody who you really valued, who had great credibility, they wouldn't have ran out and told everybody you ask them out. Even if they told you no, they would have still saw that as a compliment to them. Mm -hmm. But the problem is at the time you couldn't sort out who that was. And so that's kind of where that comes from is a, oh. a strange thing. And then I realized there are, you don't have many people like that in a school. Mm -hmm. And so, but you can't ostracize them. You can't make them be seen as the principal's pet because then they lose credibility, but they always have a global view. Your best teachers, Jared, could literally be superintendent because they already look at the world in that global view. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And most people don't look at the world in a global view. You know, we have states that have governors that don't even think of the whole state. You know, and that's that is their view, and they don't think of the whole. And so, um, anyhow, that's kind of where that came from. And it was just, I just thought everybody did that, and it really was trusting my own instincts. And also that if somebody's ineffective, I'm the only person that can do anything about that. It's nobody else's job; it's my job. And in many schools, in many schools, you know, most of the teachers are really good, but they're not all. And, and to pretend they're all the same is, is such a disservice to the good people. And many times in our schools, we have a few teachers that some kids go in and you know the day they walk in the door, they do not have a chance. And why do we have a principal if they're not gonna do anything about that? And I don't mean it in a mean attacking way. Maybe it's just working on improving them. Maybe it's, it's, it's doing a variety of different things depending on who the people are. So I don't mean it in a negative way, but that's my job. And if I don't help that teacher get better or help that teacher go somewhere else, there's no reason for me to be principal. Anybody can do lunch duty, you know, but it's those skills in which, and you have to do it in a way that you do not damage morale. You actually build it up. It's funny. I, 
when I was in Hopkins, the board hired every teacher. The board would hire the teachers. They would make all the decisions. And anyhow, I'd go in with them and I had to convince them not to do that. And they would always want to hire local people. And I'd go, you know, if you're going to hire someone local, they better be good because they're never quitting. And they'd go, well, well, they're going to be mad if they tell us, if I tell them no. And I go, well, how do you think they're going to be whenever you fire them? You know, and they go, well, we don't want to tell them no. And guess what I said? I'll tell them no. If all it took for me to be able to hire the teachers is me be willing to tell a local person no, because I'm going to have to remediate that local person anyhow if they hire a terrible, aren't I? Yeah. And I just thought everybody knew that. And then I started going, I, and I knew where we were at. No, but we're never going to get good applicants. You know, we just we're isolated. But we had four universities that would be the ones likely candidates would come from. So I'm calling the universities, the supervisors of student teachers. I've been there a month and I'm calling the supervisor of student teachers and I'm going, do you ever have principals come in and do workshops on professional dress for student teachers and read their resumes? And they go, yes. And I go, well, I'd be happy to do that. Well, of course, they never had anybody volunteer. <laughs> so then I'm going and talking to the student teachers and who's the only person they get exposure to is me. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to them, I go, if you want to be a part of the best school in the state of Missouri, this is the one to come to. And if you don't, I understand a lot of people don't want to work that hard. But if you want to make a difference from the day you walk in the door, this is the school to come into. See, I don't have a pecking order here. I don't have a seniority list. When I hire you, I want your opinion. If I didn't want your opinion, I wouldn't hire you. And if you want to be a part of the best school in the state of Missouri, this is the one to come to. Jared, which teachers are attracted to that? Probably the best ones. The best ones. Yeah. And you know what? They don't want to see my salary schedule. They just <laughs> want to be in the school. Yeah. And I thought everybody did that. And then the other thing I do with the student teacher supervisors, I tell them, do you have any up upcoming students that are outstanding student teachers? And they'd go, yes. And I go, give them to me. I'll only put them with my best teachers. I'll never give them to an average teacher. Well, if I'm a student teacher supervisor, it's a dream if my student teachers get with great teachers. Well, I'm going to do, and all of a sudden they're sending them to me. And then I, when I moved to Jefferson City, Lincoln University, which is an HBCU, which I also taught at, I would ask them, do you have any minority candidates coming through that are outstanding? Give them to me. I'm only going to give them with my best teachers. Then all of a sudden, I'm the one that gets a chance to recruit them, to improve them, and think about their skill level because they just student taught with the best teacher in a school. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to think like that all the time to be able to recruit quality because we have a teacher shortage. And many times we're in locations, we're not the highest paying district, we're not the most attractive district. So there's gotta be something about you that's most attractive because it probably isn't your salary schedule or your facilities, depending on where you're at. Wow, you're just you're just dropping all kinds of truth bombs on us, man. <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, uh, I there's so many things I wanna follow up on. I'm gonna have to choose one of them. Um, one thing I, one thing you said a few times is I thought everybody did this. I thought everybody was doing this. When did it dawn on you that not everybody was doing what you were doing? Um, when I moved to Jefferson city and we had a larger district, I would be shocked at some of the things, but it really was. My first book was dealing with difficult teachers because when I became principal in Jefferson City, at the end of my first year, my five worst teachers were gone and, the, and I didn't document any of them. And the rest of the school voted unanimously to extend the school day by 20, day, by 20 minutes a day with no pay. Well, what happened is then they take my assistant and at first it was the first one was a him and they put him in the next worst school and I had the worst school in the district when I went there. They moved him in the next worst school. Well, he had the same sex, success. Then they took my next assistant and put her in the next worst school. And I thought everybody did it. Well, then what's funny is it really was when I got in higher education that I realized nobody does it. And it'd be, I mean, it'd be like, some of it's just insecurity. It's kind of like, well, I can't have a teacher like this. I, for two years, I was an assistant principal and all I did was defend nonsense. And defending your best teacher is easy. Jared, if you get a call from a parent in the community and they're complaining about the best teacher in the district, do you feel the least bit of stress? I, I don't. No, because you know there's a really good chance the parents whacked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but even if they're not, you know the teacher would repair. Absolutely. You know, the teacher's going, I don't want that to happen. I don't want this. 
but and when but when your phone rings you're not you don't think it's going to be about your best teacher it's going to think about your worst teacher mm -hmm. and one of the things that i've always said and i and i i i have always said i'm really weird i'd rather deal with a teacher who's wrong than deal with a parent who's right and i see so many school administrators spending so much time with parents who are right mm -hmm. and i don't want to deal with parents who are right because we're wrong Mm -hmm. And I don't mind dealing with teachers who are wrong because we're right. And I didn't get, I didn't quit law school to be on the side of wrong. That's why I quit law school because I don't want to be on the side of wrong. Mm -hmm. I want to be on the side of right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm in education. Sure. You know, how nice to have a profession that we're on the side of right. Mm -hmm. But we need to do it right then because what we do is so important. So you talked about dealing with difficult teachers. At some point, you thought, I need to put this in a book. I need to put all these ideas. If you just a lot of what you're describing right there, I need to write, capture this, document this. Talk to me about what prompted you to write that book. Um, there's a couple things. One is, it, it, this is so funny. I presented a lot in Missouri because of the visitors we had come to our school and then they'd have me come and work with their schools. And my wife was doing the same thing. And I, call, I moved to Indiana, and this is what I want to do is present more because I had more freedom at the higher education than I did as a principal. And I called the state principal association director and said, I've just moved to town. I'd love to present at your fall conference, just a, you know, a breakout session, a concurrent session. And the director said, well, we've got some good ones. We've got one on retirement that's really popular. We've got <laughs> one on, you know, I mean, just all this stuff. And I said, well, just give me the worst slot in the worst time on the worst day in the worst room. And if nobody comes, it's okay. My feelings aren't hurt. It's, you know, and he goes, well, okay. He goes, what's your topic? And I literally hadn't given it one second thought. And I go, um, dealing with difficult teachers. And he goes, okay, well, it's funny. The keynote went over. My session was like at two 30 and the keynote was going to like two 45. And I was in the room by myself. And I thought, apparently they don't have any difficult teachers here in India. <laughs> and I really was not joking. I thought, well, so much for my idea. Apparently, that's not an issue. The main thing ended, and almost every single person at the entire conference came to the room. And I said, maybe they do. And then I just started presenting on that all the time. And my wife kept going, Todd, you got to write a book. These eyes you do this are too good. You got to write a book. Well, I was in higher education, and I happened to be, <laughs> I happened to be at the National Middle School Conference, and there was Heinemann Publisher who had contacted me about some of the instructional practices we were doing in my school. I, I had written about them just in an article and they were there, but no one was at their booth. And behind them was a booth called Ion Education, a booth. And I said, I go, yeah, I've got a book idea on dealing with difficult teach. I mean, on dealing with difficult teachers. And the guy goes, I'll give you a contract today. And so he goes, that idea is too good. And so um, anyhow, I wrote the book uh, one week, start to finish, never read it, turned it in and, it was the best selling book he'd ever had by far. And that's when I realized people don't know how to do this, but want to do it. And so I've always tried to write. I'm really not a book salesman, Jared. When I mention books, I'm only doing it so you have a specific source to go to to know exactly how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm really not doing it because the publisher gets more money than I do. My third book was dealing with difficult parents. And I wrote it because I was principal of three different schools and all three of my schools. I had a lot of teachers that didn't know what to say when they called parents. And I don't want you calling parents if you don't know what to say, because you're going to lose confidence. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to do it wrong because they're stronger and you're weaker. And confidence is the most valuable gift we can give. And I told you insecurity, it literally came from the same thing. We're all 13. I'm still 13. Um, when I was in, uh, in high school, I, I would seldom pick up the phone and call a girl up and ask him out for a date because I was scared to death. And I couldn't text him. If I could have texted, it would have been safer or I could ask them in person. No chance I'm gonna ask you in person. But you know what I always used to think? If somebody had been sitting next to me telling me what to say, I'd have been saying it. I would have never hesitated. I'd have been saying it. I didn't know what to say. They knew what to say no, but I never knew what to say. And what I realized is I have so many teachers that would call parents, they just don't know what to say. And once we teach you how to say, you know what's weird, Jared, you'll do it. Once I teach principals how to work with challenging teachers, it's weird, they'll do it. Once I teach teachers how to manage their class better, they'll do it because it benefits them. But, but if, I, if we have, the, I always say this, and it's true, the people that can figure it out on their own have already figured it out on their own. 
And in Waterloo, you got a few teachers that can figure it out on their own. And you got a few teachers that'll never figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'll never narrow the gap if somebody doesn't teach those people how to be effective. That's, gonna, that's just my belief. Yeah, no, the gosh, Todd, this is, <laughs> I think I, I, this is so good. I just keep like so much great knowledge that you're sharing. I'm going to go off, just off for a second here. You've talked a couple of times about the, the date. I wish somebody would have told me how to, how to date in high school, middle school. How did you, you talked about Beth briefly. You've probably told this story before. I'm curious. How did you, how did you and Beth meet? Or how did, how did all that work or who made the first move or just fill us in because I, I, your wife is obviously, you mentioned her very well known as well. Uh, I just want to know how did Todd and Beth meet back in the day? I was in a graduate class at the university of Missouri school of law the summer before I became a principal and I'd taken the class with my girlfriend Ooh. and Beth was in the class. <laughs> Uh -oh. And so uh -oh. we, were, we were a cozy little threesome that summer, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, that's how I met her. And um, she's unbelievable. She's way smarter than me. She's way better than me. And the only reason our three kids have a chance is because of her. Um, but she's the single best teacher I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen anyone who's able to manage. For one semester, she was my full-time substitute when I was at Hopkins. And there were no other substitutes. Five teachers would be absent. She'd have all five classes just in one room. And she was better than any of the teachers when they were there. Oh. And, um, and so that was really helpful. And, and she took her school, her school, there were, there were 11 elementaries in Jeff City, and her school was ranked 11th in test scores. And at the end of her first year, they were first. Huh. From 11th to first in one year. Wow. That's a little different than the average random person. Yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so, but that's how we met and, and yeah. we had an awful lot of education talk and my two daughters are teachers. And so sure, you know, we, we have a lot of education talk around the supper table. I guess so. I was just curious. I was uh, curious how that all went down. So very, very interesting. Um, let's talk about, you know, what great principals do differently. Um, this is a show that's geared more towards administrators, aspiring administrators, principal superintendents. And here's my question. You wrote the book in 2002, updated in 2013. So it's been seven years. Is there anything, if you were to go and update that book um, today, is there anything that you would change or, well, or add? I'm not going to believe this, but the updated version came out this summer. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't blame you. If you've read it, you're sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, I added two things. And uh, it's funny. I, I wanted to update what great teachers do differently because I have a uh, stuff now that I present on three emotional modes, business, parent, child, and it's old information, but I've applied it to education and I've never had a stronger response to anything in, in teaching than this. And I wanted to put it out there in a, in, in form for people. And so that was the incentive. And on the principal book, one of the chapters I wanted to write is leadership's not an event. Because social, and I'm a social media guy, so I'm not being critical. On social media, it seems like everything's an event. And we don't need events. You know, it's great if you kiss a pig. But you know what? I'm laughing at you if you're no good. I'm not laughing with you. And I'll tell you a story I think I put in the book. I don't, I don't, I can't remember, but I was at a, do you know what a Sam's Club is, Jared? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't want to brag, but I'm a member. And, um, and actually I'm a business member, so we can go in an hour early. So I go in an hour early every day and just taunt the little people who aren't allowed in yet. But uh, that's a joke, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, anyhow, before COVID, like I think it was February this year. So fairly recently, I'm checking out at the Sam's Club in Columbia, Missouri. And there's someone in a dinosaur suit dancing up at the front of the club. And kind of with everything in the world, it makes you a little nervous. You know, is this person supposed to be there? Is it like a weirdo who walked in in a dinosaur suit? What's going on? And the clerk said, that's our manager. We love him. Okay. So the person in the dinosaur suit was the manager of Sam's Club and he was dancing. Yep. A lady behind me in line, a customer just like me, said, I wish my manager wore a dinosaur suit. And I said... No, you don't. You wish your manager was good. If your manager was good, you didn't care if they wore a dinosaur suit. Hmm. And if your manager's no good and they wore a dinosaur suit, you'd be going, who's the ass hat in the dinosaur suit? Mm -hmm. But see, we think it's an event. 
Your great teachers aren't an event. They're every day. Mm -hmm. Jared, you have average teachers that have events. Mm -hmm. You have poor teachers that have events. I mean, good events, but they're still not effective. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with events though, Jared. There's no, your best teacher also can have events, but you know what? You have other teachers that every day, they're just really, really good every single day. They never have an event. Mm -hmm. And you know what? They don't need one, do they? Mm -mm. And so I, I just wanted us to understand it's what we do every day. It's not an event. Sure. And there's too much portrayal of events. And I'm not putting down events, please. I mean, I write about stuff that's events and things that I've done and things like that. But I, I tell one other story. Uh, when I was principal in Jeff City, we used to have a spring carnival for my middle school kids. And they'd have a dunking booth. And it was funny, lots of the teachers and administrators and other people would get on the dunking booth. Two people would draw the long lines, the best people and the worst people. The best people, because you want to be a part of it. You know, I want to tease the best teacher yeah, and the best course. teacher's teasing yeah. me. And, and we're, we're teammates. And the worst teacher, I wanted to dunk them my whole life. <laughs> and I, I think we just have to realize that as a leader and teach all our teachers that too. That, it, you know, I talk about 10 days out of 10, but it, I wanted to also share, it's just, it's just not an event. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm not opposed to events. You know, there's nothing wrong with events, it's, but that's not what leadership is. That's not what teaching is. It's, I always say, we're not, this isn't a dinner party. You know, I can event my way through a dinner party, but teaching's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you gotta do it every day and that's a little different. You can glad hand your way at a, at a dinner party, but that's not what we have. No. And, that, and, it's, and if we ever lose sight of that, you know, it, it's interesting because we talk about relationships, 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 and stuff like that, which have been on the on social media. It's so much more complicated than relationships. Mm. You know, your best teacher may or may not ever ask a kid about their puppy, and they're the best teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the best teacher, yep. and you don't care if they ask about the puppy or not. And you know what's weird? Neither do the kids. Your best teacher may or may not know, go to the kids' basketball games. And the kids don't care. It's a huge treat if they do. I'm not trying to be belittle it. And if your worst teacher goes to a basketball game, the worst teacher is going to say something smart like and rude about it the next day in class anyhow. And I'm not putting down going to the basketball game. But it's just, you know, it's funny. I talk a lot. I do a lot with classroom management now because I've realized, think about this. In your district, what percent of teachers would like their job better if they were better at managing their classroom? What percent? Well, a hundred percent. hundred percent. Yep. But Jared, what percent would significantly like their job better? Would you give me at least half? Oh yeah. Right. So I don't know why we're working on anything before we get everyone to be masterful at classroom management. So mm -hmm. they, so they like their jobs better. Mm -hmm. If you don't teach the bus drivers how to manage kids, the bus drivers start to hate the kids and, and nothing gets better in that there is. So it's really funny. I, I thought that was, that seems old school. And I realize actually it's, it's, it's relevant or more relevant than anything else we can think of. And, and one of the things I talk about, I use examples. I'm not going to give you the example because of time, but I use an example of a clip chart where you clip kids up and down. And it's interesting. Somebody will raise their hand and go, we don't do that because that humiliates kids. And I go, that clip chart doesn't humiliate kids. The ineffective teacher humiliates kids. Mm -hmm. If you have a clip up, clip down chart in your best teacher's classroom, how many years would he or she teach before they'd ever humiliate a kid? They never would, would they? And if your worst teacher who humiliates kids using clip up, clip down, if that chart was gone, they'd continue to humiliate kids in some other fashion. So quit thinking it's some chart. You know, it's like, it's like um, flexible seating. Flexible seating is not the problem. Flexible seating is not the solution. You have great teachers that use flexible seating. You have great teachers that don't use flexible seating. You have ineffective teachers that use flexible seating. You have ineffective, ineffective teachers that don't use flexible seating. What is not the variable? Flexible seating. And I'm not putting it down because if that gets a teacher juiced up, why would I not do everything in my power, Jared, to support them having flexible seating? Because I want them to be excited. Them being excited is the benefit, not the flexible seating. But we think that's the problem or the solution. And you'll have an, in, you'll meaning us in education, we'll have an ineffective teacher using flexible seating. Do you know what our decision is? We ban flexible seating. And we don't do anything to improve 
And, and then we punish the people for being good who really want to do flexible seating because we're afraid of dealing with the ineffective people. So I love everything. I, I mean, I'm totally bought into what you're saying. Why do you feel like, I'm trying to frame a question. Why do you feel like so many leaders out there don't do these things? I, I mean, you, what you're telling me, I agree with everything, but I, as I see leaders in other districts, like they're not, they're, they're not doing these things still. You've been, you've been preaching these things for 20 plus years. Um, and it's not just you, there's other people too. How can we have so many leaders that don't have these same mindsets when they approach the job? A couple of reasons. One of them is we see so much average, we think average is right. And you understand if we're average, we hope average is right. In my book, Shifting the Monkey, which takes you one average restroom visit to finish. In my book, Shifting the Monkey, I talk about a blanket monkey, which means instead of dealing with the one person we should be dealing with, we throw it on everybody. Well, let's think about in your state, the largest group that does that. It's the State Department. And Jared, it doesn't matter what state I'm talking about. Let's pretend in Iowa, you have two dysfunctional districts and eight dysfunctional schools. I'm making up numbers. I don't know anything about this. Let's pretend you have two dysfunctional districts and eight dysfunctional schools. How many schools and districts should the State Department be dealing with, Jared? I was taking a drink there, Todd. I'm sorry. You have, was... Okay, I'll say it slow. If you have sure. two dysfunctional districts yep. and eight dysfunctional schools, okay, gotcha. how many schools and districts should the State Department be dealing with? I would think all those those dysfunctional districts and schools you're talking so about. Two dysfunctional eight, districts and yes. eight dysfunctional schools. How many schools and districts does the State Department deal with, deal with, Jared? They deal with all of them. Right, because they're afraid of the two and eight. Uh, could they? Yeah. Do you really have that many skilled people that could go in and improve those two districts and those eight schools? So instead, what they do is there's new teacher evaluation for everybody, new A through F for everybody, new standardized test for everybody, new totally whatever agree. for everybody. Well, what happens is that's a blanket monkey. You got blanket uh, monkey. Yeah. Now, Jared, the average superintendent in the average district in the average state doesn't deal with their two dysfunctional principals. They send a note to all their principals that say some principals haven't turned in their reports yet. Hmm. If the two best principals are the only two that react to that and they're thinking, hey, deal weed, what are you talking to me for? There's only nine of us. Why don't you talk to the two who are doing it instead of me? The average principals see average leaders do average things and guess what they think's right? That. And has the average principal sent a note that said some teachers have not turned in their grades yet? And which teacher is most offended when that note comes around? The best teacher, the one whose life is driven by guilt. Best teacher. And you, how many of you have seen a principal or a superintendent or a state commissioner, or a business leader, or the head of Microsoft, none of it's education, it's just I care about education. How many of you ever seen a principal have talked to all the teachers about one teacher at a faculty meeting? All the time. Sometimes some of you, sometimes some of you are coming late, sometimes some of you, <laughs> and who's offended? The best teacher, and you know what they're thinking, what are you talking to me for? Why don't you talk to her? She's not even here yet. Uh -huh. And then two parents <laughs> don't show up for the field trip, so do we note, send a note to all the parents. A coach has a kid skip practice, so they run all the rest of the kids. But what's strange is, Jared, it only seems weird when I explain it. It doesn't seem weird when we see it every day. Because we're so used to average, we think average is right. I, I'm just curious. Do you do you feel like that type, what you just described there, is that is that um, just an education? Or do you feel like that's in all sectors? Oh. Across the I walk board. in an antique, my wife and I do antique shopping. And um, uh, we walk in an antique store and there's a sign that says, uh, pretty to look at, pretty to hold, but if it gets broken, consider it sold, okay? <laughs> a thief who goes in and breaks something, are they gonna turn themselves in? And you know what? I'm scared to go in the store because I might actually break something. Uh, uh. And the only people that take that are people whose lives are driven by guilt. And it's like, you ever seen a sign on a school that says all visitors must report to the office and the word must is bold. They bold the word must. And instead, why do we talk to our ineffective people? Why don't we talk to our effective people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put a sign on the side of a school that says, welcome parents, guests, and visitors. Thank you so much for visiting our school. 
We do ask for the safety of all of our students, faculty, and staff that each time you come, you please register all the office. Thank you so much for your cooperation and support. You know, schools have assemblies the first day of school and lecture all the kids about the rules. You know, and which kids are most uncomfortable? The good ones. And what are the other kids doing? Plotting. That's what they're doing. They're plotting. But we don't, it's, it's partly because, you know, we send a note home to all the parents because we don't know what to do with the one parent. And I try to teach people what to do with the one parent so that you never need to send a note to all the parents. Because what I think strange is we're afraid of making the disgruntled person mad. And I'm afraid of making the good people mad. Because the disgruntled people are always going to be mad. And when you cater to them, you know who you lose? The good people. Isn't that the strangest thing? We're worried. And I don't, I don't have any interest in ticking off negative people. But we're worried about ticking off negative people. And I'm worried about ticking off the non-negative people. You know, we, most of us went virtual with, uh, uh, I, won't, I had to go virtual in March, suddenly with this. And I say, what made it so hard is we didn't have a dress rehearsal. We just went to opening night. But what I think is funny is, and this is the way you have to think. And I just thought everybody thought this way. Jared, let's pretend a teacher has 25 kids in class. They go virtual overnight and they have 11 kids. Do you know what I tell my teachers their number one goal is? Don't let it get to 10. Because those are going to be 11 salespeople then. You know, 11 people telling their kids, hey, this class is actually good. And I don't want to miss it. Most teachers complain to the 11 about the 14 that aren't there. I, I don't even get it. I'm never going to complain to the 11. I might complain to the 14 who aren't there that they're not there, but I'm never going to complain to the 11. I don't, I don't even understand why we do that because I never want it to go to 10. And instead we're, we're more upset about the 14 that aren't, I, I've talked to teachers this year who are really ticked off because they really want to hold these kids accountable this year of all years. It's, we live in a revenge world. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. We live in a revenge world. We mm. want revenge and I don't get it. You know, I, you know, I talk about the clip up, clip down chart. You're ineffective and average. See, not even ineffective, you're average teachers. When they clip a kid down, do you know what they make sure they do? Stare at the kid. <laughs> Why would I stare at the kid? I'm the teacher. <laughs> I'm in charge of the class. Why would I stare at the kid? I don't wanna draw any attention to the kid. I want the kid to stop be misbehaving. I don't want to give them more attention. I'm not going to look at the chart. I'm not going to look at the kid. I just click the kid down and I continue to teach because the kids paying attention are more important than the kid not paying attention. And I never mean this in a demeaning way. I don't mean that as a put down at the other. My last school had 1,350 middle school kids. Do you know how I could be in office in, in be, excuse me, you know how I could be in classrooms every single day, Jared? When a kid gets sent to the office, do you know what I tell my assistants? That's the least important kid in the school. Quit making them out to be the most important kid. And nobody defends teachers like I do, nobody. But why would I be in a hurry to deal with that kid? Let them sit there. Do you have a teacher in the school in a hurry to get them back? And I punish 1100 or 1,349 kids by not giving them attention and I'm doing it at the expense of this kid. And, and why would we ever think like that? I don't understand it. Gosh, you're, this is so good, Todd. Uh, I was going to ask you a question about COVID uh, uh, and you kind of hit it. Um, my question was, you know, you have a presentation called Motivating People During Difficult Times. Uh, and clearly we're working in what I would consider difficult times. Sure. Uh, and you kind of hit on, is there any, my question was going to be, what would Todd Whitaker do if you're leading a building right now? And you hit on a few things, but what would you do if you're leading a building and motivating your staff during difficult times during right now? Well, Jared, remember leadership's not an event. And you know the problem with leaders trying to motivate teachers now? They weren't motivating them before. They didn't have credibility. They didn't have trust. They weren't valued. L let, me, let me put it in a different way. Jared, when you, in March, you went virtual kind of overnight. Am I correct? We did. Yeah. Okay. Like, yep. like everybody in the country. So I'm not, yeah. that's not a put down of you. Could you name three teachers you knew were going to figure it out? Absolutely. Could you name three teachers you knew were never going to figure it out? Absolutely. Okay. So tell me what that has to do with COVID, virtual, or anything. 
Nothing. So you know what I got to do? I got to get all my teachers like my best teachers. So as a, how many schools do you have in your district? We've got three. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> could you know, I mean, could you name one of the principals that you thought is probably going to figure out, and I, you, know, you don't even have to answer if you're scared, but hypothetically, could you name yeah, one of the principals absolutely. that you thought were going to figure it out quicker than the others? Absolutely, yep. And could you name one that might struggle the most with figuring it out? Yep. Okay. Are you worried about what the best principal is going to do to motivate their teachers during difficult times? Not worried. No. And that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean it's not harder. That doesn't mean they have to think differently. I'm not making light. It's exhausting. But it's the same skill set. And see, we think it's a different skill set. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad it's not a different skill set because then you'd be going, I don't know which of the principals will do it. It's hard to know. I don't know which teachers will do it. It's hard to know. It isn't that way at all. You know exactly which ones it will. And when you go back from virtual to in-person, the same three teachers you knew couldn't do virtual, couldn't do in-person. So I think that it's the same thing. I compliment my teachers. I value my teachers. I stroke my teachers. Do you know what I told principal? Because during the summer, I was doing tons of workshops all around the world. And um, one of the things, I'm one of the few people whose personality is so annoying, it comes across exactly the same on Zoom. And um, the only, the, the best benefit of not having me in person is the smell. So keep that in mind. But you know what I told principals I would do? Here's something I do. I teach principals all the time when you're in person. Go into your best teacher's classroom when they need it. So when you're whipped, when you're worn out, a tough time of year, you know, just a, it's a Tuesday and it's already seemed like the longest week of the year, whatever, whatever it is. Go into your best teacher's classroom and leave one note. Okay, go into the best teacher's classroom and leave one note. Leave a note that says, I was sitting down in my office and I forgot what school was. And I wanted to come into your classroom so that I could remember what school was. Thanks for being here for all the students. And thanks for being here for me. Jared, is that teacher ever gonna forget that? Probably not. Most of us have never received a note that night in our life, that nice in our life, and we've married someone. <laughs> you know what I told principals to do this summer? I want you to call not text, not email. I want you to call your best teachers. And I want you to say, do you know what I miss most about school? You. Because that is what you miss most. You know, it's funny, I haven't been a principal in years and people go, don't you miss the students? You know what I always say? Yeah, but I really miss the teachers. You know what I miss? Going in the best teacher's classroom and seeing how excited the kids were. That means a lot more to me than being around the students. Going in the best teacher's classroom and not wanting to leave going in a great teacher's classroom and wanting to be invited back when the kids do their projects because I can't wait to see what the projects are. That's what I miss. And see, we can do that all the time, Jared, whether it's in person and you could text people, you could email. I'm not saying just but that in-person phone call. But what happens is we're worried about doing it with everyone, not me. I'm worried about doing it with the people that most miss it. Now I have a Friday focus, which is the best leadership tool I've ever used. And it's in motivating, inspiring teachers. And I don't know how a principal doesn't have that. I'm using that for my whole faculty, but individually I am stroking and valuing people all the time. But does that take pressure off teachers when I say if you have 11 kids and you'd like to have 25 because you have 25 on your roster, keep at least keep it at 11. Does and that give you more control than the 14 that don't show up? Oh yeah, we've, I, we've been guilty of focusing on the 14. Right. And I'm not saying you don't, but never at the expense of the 11. That's really the critical part. Mm -hmm. And people go, isn't that preaching to the choir? And I go, yep. Because if the choir stops coming, nobody's going to come to your church. You know, and, and, and the people I have, think about this. If I'd like to, my last uh, year as a principal, we had over 1,500 people come to open house night, back to school night. When I started, we had about 20. And one of the things is, I, if I have 20 people, I want to make sure those 20 are going to come the next year. And they don't need to hear about the 1,480 people that aren't there. They don't need to hear about that. I might talk to my assistant principal in private about it, but they don't need to hear about it. I, I don't understand that. Um, I'm a customer. I don't need to. I, I, I work with retail businesses, too. And I say never take it out on your next customer the way the last customer treated you, because the next customer doesn't deserve it. 
You know, they don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And I've said that to businesses before. I go, I don't know whose fault it is, but I know it's not mine. So please stop talking to me like that. Uh, you know, I don't know whose fault it is, but I know it's not mine. Yeah. And, you know, people will change their behavior. Just nobody ever. And you don't lose people doing this. It's just you're telling people the truth. They've never had the truth in their life. And I'm saying it, on, I'm on their side. I talk to parents about social media. Them, they're the ones that are social media attack dogs. And I go, my biggest fear is that if you put stuff like this on social media, the other kids will not like your daughter. That's good. That's classic. That's and good. I'm, not, I'm not being mean. Because what's their biggest fear is the other kids won't like their daughter. And they never thought of it that way. You know, you'd mentioned COVID and masking. Masking's kind of, Missouri is a hillbilly country Western state where nobody <laughs> wears, I mean, it's, it's politic, it's the craziest thing literally I've ever seen. But you know, what's interesting is my mom's 96. And do you know why I, I, I want people to wear a mask, Jared? Keep her so my mom doesn't, so my mom doesn't feel funny when she wears a mask. Hmm. It's not safety. It's not health. You could argue about safety and health, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't argue about the fact my mom's going to feel funny if she's the only one wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. She's 96. She doesn't deserve to feel like she's 13. And you know why I'm going to wear a mask, Jared? So your mom doesn't feel funny and your dad doesn't feel funny and your wife or your kids or your family or your neighbors. That's how come. See, you can argue about the physical safety, can't you? I've literally gone into stores, told my mom to wait in the car, gone into stores and said, I'm bringing my mom. She's 96. You know what she asked me? Am I going to be the only one wearing a mask? I said, I don't want to bring her in if she's going to be the only one wearing a mask. And just let me know. Because if you all aren't going to wear a mask, it's okay. I'm not going to bring her in here. I'll find some other place for my 96-year-old mom to go to. I've never had anybody say a word. I've had people leave the store that don't have masks on and people put them on. My mom walks in and she goes, oh, good. I'm not the only one. Huh. See, could we have approached the world in that way? Sure. Yeah. Huh. Then we're on a team. We're team America then. Yep. You know. Todd, I, I, this is, uh, this is great. Um, th thank you so much for, for, for all this expertise. You're, you're just all kinds of stuff that is just incredible for us, us leaders, aspiring leaders uh, to hear. Uh, I do have, I, I, I'm going to ask one of our listener questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I don't mind at all. Okay, so I got a handful. I'm going to pick one here um, because at this covered... point in the podcast, my guess is we have no listeners. So go ahead. And ask <laughs> <No. any questions. laughs> well, when I when I said Todd's coming on the show, I had a lot of people lining up to give me questions. So Jeremy, who's a middle school principal, um, asked, "What would you tell your first year principal self about a career as a school leader?" It's the best career you can have. There's nothing else that's going to make a more significant difference. It's also hard. The hardest position in a district is the high school principal because it's open. The high school is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But there's nothing that's going to be more significant than you being a school leader. Nothing. N people are going to look up to you more than any other. You are a community leader, no matter what the size of your community is. And you have an unbelievable chance to impact people. It's interesting. The last week I was on a Twitter chat on Monday uh, and uh, Somebody asked something about how do we motivate, how do, how do principals take care of students? And I said, great principals take care of students by taking care of their teachers. And that's what you have to do. We're, we're, principals are confused. They think their job is to teach the students. No, it's to teach the teachers. That's the job. That is the job. And you know what your job is as superintendent? Teach your principals. If you have three outstanding principals, your job is cake, Jared. And if you don't, your job's a nightmare, Jared. <laughs> and, and that every superintendent's the same way, but somehow we get confused as to what our job is. It's, I, I almost called a, bu a bunch of my books. It's simple. It's just not always easy. But it's simple. Our jobs are simple. It's just not easy. I had a question about your books. I know you said once you write them, you're done. I was going to ask you, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but do you have a favorite book of yours? Is there one you're look, you know, you've got that large, that stack to your right there, it looks like. Is there one that you'd say, that's my favorite? What great principles do differently is the closest to my core. It is the core of me. Um, so probably that, uh, 
Shifting the Monkey, I like because it's written for the world. I've written two books for the world, and those are two of my favorites, The Ball, which I think I'm trying to get into a Hallmark movie. Um, and uh, But I haven't, I don't have anything called Evergreen Canyon in, uh, <laughs> as a site. So, um, but uh, The Ball, and it's it's funny, it was written for the world. It happens to involve, it's a, it's a teacher that runs into a former student who's a grocery store manager. And literally, it'll take you 50 minutes. This is funny, this is the way I write books probably six or seven years ago, it was Memorial Day and I was out running. And I was in Kentucky and I was running and this story popped into my head and I got back and wrote it start to finish wow. that night. And it's a, now it looks like it took me less time than that. So keep that in mind. But, um, and that's the way I, one day I, I dreamt, dreamt that Alan Jackson was singing me a song and I got up and wrote the song. And I was going to mail it to him and I've lost it and I haven't been able to find the, the song then. So it's kind of a weird thing, but it's that that shifting the monkey and the ball may be my other two favorite books. But what great principles do differently is the closest book to my core. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Alan Jackson, you mentioned, who is your favorite? This is totally random. Favorite musical artist. <laughs> it's random. Well, I, know. I was a big fan of country music for a long time. George Jones and Alan Jackson and but I like Bruno Mars a lot. I like Maroon 5. Wow. Um, I'm a Stones fan. Um, all, all Super Bowl. You've probably been enjoying the Super Bowls then with all those. The Stones yeah, were on the Super true, Bowl. Right, yes. Bruno Mars, Maroon 5. <laughs> yes. Um, and I became a Beatles fan only because my son was a giant Beatles fan. And I used to take him to concerts all the time. Okay. And I never liked the Beatles. And I took him to Paul McCartney. And it was the most amazing concert I've ever seen. And so I kind of like the Beatles because of that. But um Kind of anything. I'm, I'm also a, a Diamond Rio I like a lot. Uh, Sawyer Brown I like a lot. I said not everybody likes Sawyer Brown, but some girls do. Um, that's a Sawyer Brown joke. I, I'm not even sure that. if I I'll be honest. I'm not sure if I know Sawyer Brown. At all. And at Christmas time, I love Straight No Chaser. Okay, yeah. They're an acapella group. Yeah, that's absolutely. And the other great Christmas album is Phil Spector's 1963 album. Uh, the wall of sound it's one of the greatest albums of all time too and so i like that a lot so okay yeah. i just was curious i mean you're just so fascinating to listen to i knew you'd give me a well-rounded eclectic answer there and you did not yeah. disappoint so I love that. Uh, so hey todd you I, I usually finish off the show with just some quick hitter questions kind quick of first hit, and i know you didn't look at these ahead of time so these might be you know these might be tricky for you so well but you're natural so okay if we're in columbia missouri best place you got to check out restaurant bar it does, you you name it the bar dial my favorite restaurant bar uh i still haven't eaten indoors since the COVID started and bar dial has outdoor heaters and my wife and i or whoever we go with are the only people out there so they bring all the heaters around us so it's a uh, it's great. It's called the Bard Out. It's my favorite place. That and check out Mizzou football and basketball. Okay. Okay. What is the best up to $50 purchase you have made in the last six months? Well, my outdoor swimming pool is still open and it is extremely cold. And I bought a swim cap and it is the best because <laughs> your head's what gets freezing and it's running from the house and leaping into the water and uh, then the swim cap is the best purchase I've made. And it's a good look. I put it on right now, except I just don't have it with me and I don't want to mess with the moose. Uh, but, but a swim cap was the best purchase I have done because it, that water is so cold. So is there, I, I, I have never bought a swim cap. Um, is there different types of swim caps or is there just kind of one general swim cap? Well, actually... I have no clue. My wife goes, you ought to wear a swim cap. And one day she brought one home. So no idea. Um, okay. <laughs> and my head's the size of a Buick. So it probably was a lot of effort to be able to find <laughs> one that, that fit there. But that's really been a, a very helpful. So that's, but I haven't bought anything. And how long has it been since we bought anything? Just that's true. Uh, the other thing is we bought some puzzles and we put, and my family was here for Thanksgiving. And we're all very cautious and social distance and all this stuff. And so that we can be together. And we bought these 2,000 piece puzzles. Oh, wow. 2,000. And we put one together at Thanksgiving, but 12 pieces fell on the floor and the dog ate them. Oh. And so we finished it with, so we don't have a 2,000 piece puzzle. We have a 1,900 
88 piece puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, but that, that's been really fun. We bought puzzles and the family, we just love doing puzzles, which I never thought we would, but it's kind of like we're stuck here. So what the heck? Sure, sure. And family actually gets along pretty good. So good. We're yeah. lucky. And you said you've got some family there right now. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I do. My son uh, is in New York City. He graduated from Columbia University and he's a freelance writer. And so he writes everywhere and primarily works for a, a place in Columbia that hired him last summer. And um, he tore his labrum in his hip, which I don't know what that means, but they never heal. And so they only can be repaired by surgery. And uh, he didn't, he was on the fourth floor apartment in Brooklyn and he didn't want to deal with crutches and New York City. And he, for, so he's been home and he's going back in January. But he started running again just this week, so I'm glad. And then my daughter, Madeline, is working on her doctorate at Mizzou. She lives about 90 minutes away. So her and our grandson, who's two, come up three days a week uh, for her to attend classes. And um, then my other daughter's in Kansas City, and she comes in. She was here for Thanksgiving, and she'll be here for – she's my running buddy, swimming buddy. She's the only one that will get in the pool with me at this cold. And um, so uh, we did a 10K on Thanksgiving morning. and. I finished fourth in my age group and luckily there are only four people in my age group. So it was perfect. And you said you, you swim run. Uh, well, you said you swim every, six days a week. Is that right? And lift yeah. six days a week. And yeah. t- just tell me about, you know, one of our questions is about routine. Just what, what is your daily routine? Um, well, it's funny. The, the running started because when I in, uh, when I turned 22 on July 5th, that year, I decided to start running and I probably have missed two days a year, maybe working out at most some day, some days, none, some years, none. And I've been very lucky health wise. And, um, and it, it really helped me as a principal, because if you're up at five 15 in the morning in a driving rain at 37 degrees, that angry parent is nothing. I mean, and I don't mean you're rude to him. I just mean, it's just nothing. And that really helped me. And I, do it so early so I could be home before my kids get up so that that way they don't even know I've done anything. Um, and so, and I've just always done that. I just make myself every day, just get up and, and, uh, and if it's funny because of traveling so much, I work out every day when I'm on the road. And, um, now if I have to leave for the airport at three 30 in the morning, I'm in the swimming pool at two 30 in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, wow. but it, it makes me, I feel good about it. You know, I just, I'm not particularly athletic, but I'm extremely devoted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So you, the, we always ask one question about books. So what is one book that has greatly influenced your life? I am truly the only person you've ever known that's written more books than they've read. But of any, the only book I've ever read that, I thought was beneficial to me related to like business, professional, anything like that is called first break all the rules. And that's the only book I've ever read. Many times I read a book and that causes me to write a book. A couple of famous authors who are way more famous than me in education wrote books on change and, and their books are basically this one of them who's very famous, who people know his books are all this type of thing. First you get a million dollars. Secondly, you get your entire faculty on board. Now what you do is, and what's the part everybody wants to know? How do I get a million dollars and how do I get everybody on board? Well, he doesn't write that because he doesn't know how to do that. Uh, uh-huh, and uh-huh. then the other one is another book on change was, here's what you need to change to. And I thought everybody knows what they need to change to. They just don't know how. And so that's what I tried to book. But first break on the, all the rules was the best inspiration for that type of thing. It's really, honestly, the only leadership business book I've ever read that I can even remember. I read a, a fair amount of true, true crime. Okay. Like Ann rule who passed away, yeah. unfortunately, but a lot of true crime stuff. My wife always says, if something happens to her, you know who to look to. So, um, but I just like it. I don't know why it's diversion. Do you and your wife watch Netflix? I hardly ever watch TV. Okay. Okay. I watch I'll... sports once in a while. Sure. Um, we do watch the Hallmark channel. I am a broken man. Um, and so we are only all allowed to watch HGTV and Hallmark. Um, the other day I walked through, my wife goes, uh, Todd, do you want to watch a Hallmark movie with me? And I said, sure, honey. Is it the one with the sniper? Cause if it's the one with the sniper, I haven't seen it yet, but if it doesn't have a sniper, I think I've seen it a hundred times. So, uh, 
But no, I, and this is the truth on the Hallmark Christmas movies this year, I have not, not cried at a single one yet. Not, not cried. Wow. Yes. So that's a double You're, negative, which shouldn't okay. be in there. Yeah. And that's why I want my book, The Ball, to be a Hallmark movie, because I know the rhythm of Hallmark movies and they're emotional. You know, the TV commercial where the, the guy gets the cell phone and he's dancing to the Leon Redbone song. It's the best TV commercial I've ever seen. I have not watched it yet and not cried. Uh, my wife was reading our grandson last night, The Polar Express, and I was talking to my son and I'm crying because I can hear it. So that kind of stuff I like a lot. It means a lot to me. Sure. Uh, okay, just a couple more questions here for you. Sure. I, know, I know you've got uh, another uh, commitment coming up here in a little bit. Um, it, we always ask this question, can you recall a job you applied for, but you did not get? And what did you learn from the experience? Uh, yes, the job I can most remember I applied for my second year at Indiana State, I applied to be a professor at Iowa University. And they interviewed three people. And it was the funniest thing in the world because I really wanted to be in Iowa. I thought that'd be the perfect place to be. It's sort of near Missouri. I like Iowa City. And I applied and true story. And one of the people still at Iowa, I think. And um, the person goes, at Iowa, you teach two classes a semester. At Indiana State, you teach four classes a semester. Okay, just the difference in just, it's a, it's a research level institution. And I was at Indiana State and uh, anyhow, I had been there two years and I had a book I'd written and I had like six articles and I brought them and showed them and they said, how do you do this teaching two classes a semester? And I go, oh, well, I go, and I didn't know anything about that. And I go, well, I teach four classes a semester and they go, you do not. And I go, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? I do not. I didn't say it like that. I was not, uh -huh. you know, you're uh -huh. an interviewer, you're pretending. And I go, no, we have to teach four classes. I go, they're listed here on the thing. And they go, no, you can't do this and teach four classes. And I go, and they didn't hire me and they didn't hire any of the people. And that's when I realized, and I don't mean this in this way, but and this isn't about me. So I'm changing this, but this is how come you can hire exceptional people because average people are terrified of them. Because Jared, when you make a mistake, you know your best teachers know it. That's, that's who you're worried about seeing. Mm -hmm. Your best teacher. You're not worried about seeing your worst teachers. You're worried about seeing your best teachers because you know they know. But if you have confidence to hire them and you can rely on them like we talked about at the very beginning, that's all I want. We talk a lot about like um, when you look, everything happens for a reason. Oh, it, it's been the greatest thing that ever happened because then I was at Indiana State and I decided, what did we like about here? Iowa probably wouldn't have written, let me write all the practitioner books I've done. They would have wanted research things. No, it was a great thing. I just meant, but that was you sure. would ask. And, and no, I love that. I mean, I'm, I'm really bummed that my, <laughs> you talk about your love for Missouri. I have a love for the Hawkeyes. <laughs> and so that is a huge loss for us. I am, I, I had no idea. I did not know that story. Well, the problem know. is they also did background checks back then. And so that was the, the my best friend was from West Branch. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's actually a suburb of West Branch, Coralville. Okay. No, no, no. Um, or no, the other no, way. Not, yeah. No, no, not Coral. Coralville's bigger. It's um. I've been there. I was at Iowa City on the coldest day in their history. They lost to Penn State in basketball, and I got frostbite. It was minus twenty four. It was probably nineteen ninety three or four. Sure. And I was. I've been in Iowa City many different times. I cannot think of Oasis. The only thing they have is a grain as a grain elevator <laughs> that they have no stores oasis and it's about wow. 15 miles from west branch i mean i've never even heard of that either so it must be yeah. tiny <laughs> yes my best uh, and i've written a couple of books with him uh dale lumpa okay oh that's yeah. that's a cool story um okay hey one more question for you i mean you've accomplished so much uh you got a lot of things going i always ask what is one big goal you're currently working on um my absolute dream that I've been working on mentally for years is a book called How to Get All Teachers to Be Like the Best Teachers. Because in my mind, that's the only solution to education. In every place in Iowa, including Oasis, you have at least, in every school, you have at least one teacher that's cracked the Da Vinci Code. You know what that tells me? We don't need anything else. We need more of that. We don't need new uh, uh, inventions. We don't need new whatever. We need more of that. 
And since you have one teacher that can do it with the kids you have, with the budget you have, with the leadership you have, and the state you have, with the commissioner you have, that means it's possible. And now it's just figuring out how do we help everybody else become like that? And that's my number one project mentally, emotionally, that I feel like I have the most desire to uh, get out that I feel like that's the only solution I can think to education. Instead, we always think we blow, we don't need to blow it up. We've solved it. We just haven't solved it enough. So it seems to me like the the few book examples you've given and uh, you've shared in this interview, just kind of, you got you got back from a run or whatever, and you wrote it. And it sounds like you've got this, this book idea floating around in your head. Right. Uh, what do you think it's going to take for you to, all right, this is the time. I'm going to do it. Um, well, it's funny. I write by presenting. If you've read my books, they're me talking. And so maybe it's taken me three years, but I wrote it in a week, but it took me three years to think of it. You know, it's funny. Last night I was talking to a bunch of pre-service teachers and I talked about Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert. Do you know what your great teachers they have? They spent 10,000 hours right here. They, when they were babysitting, they were working on how do I get the kids to do this? When they were little, they were arranging the room so that the teddy bears were here with the teaching and they were reading and turning and showing the book the other way. Um, they, the, we, we can have 10,000 hours here because you have teachers that have taught for 30 years that have never put in 10,000 hours. And you have other teachers that are 22 years old who have put in 10,000 hours. And so that's, that comes from all of that type of stuff. So I'm really actually just deciding what kind of what publisher would most value it, would most be able to communicate its importance. It's important to me. And if people don't read it, I mean, I've had other books I thought were going to be good, that could be good, that people good, that people didn't, that people didn't read. But this really is, and, and I present on it so much, I know it's the solution because I can see the response in the people that I present to, teachers and principals and pre-service, and it doesn't make any difference. Oh, God. That's in my opinion, that's the thing I'm most excited about, but I just haven't, I kind of have an outline, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet. Okay. Well, God, I, I, I cannot wait for that to, to, to come to fruition and, and, uh, and get out there. So, um, very exciting. Um, Todd, is there anything else? Um, you've shared so much. It, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to listen to you. Is there anything else that, um, that we didn't get to that you wanted to, wanted to share? I want to thank everybody in the audience, people who are educators, who are principals, who are teachers, who are superintendents, who are all the other positions that sometimes you leave out when you list them, because you all are the ones that make a difference every day. And I, I really mean this. People, you know, thank me for coming or doing this. I don't work for a living. You all work for a living. I know what work is. You all do the work. I don't do the work. And I may travel for a living sometimes, but I don't work for a living. And I just appreciate what you do, because what you do is so important. And, and I truly mean this. I want to thank everyone, but we're also blessed because we have chosen a profession that matters. And I'll be honest, most professions don't really matter. And I'm glad there's other people doing the jobs that don't matter because we needed to leave the jobs that matter for the people that are in your audience, for the people that are in your school district, that are people that are in our schools. Um, you know, and I do say this though, and I mean it sincerely, the best part about teaching is it matters, but the hardest part about teaching is it matters every day. That's why we need breaks. That's why we need time off. That's why this year has been so difficult, I think, is because emotionally you weren't off this summer. Even the teachers who didn't have students and weren't teaching, they weren't emotional off because it was everything so unknown and chaotic. And, you know, when you go virtual, you're kind of on 24-7 on too. Um, and we're already with that way with email and with other things. Um, but, but that's the thing I most want to say is what you all do literally makes a difference. The other thing is school leaders have been the leaders for the country. You know, the, the biggest joke in the world, people say schools should open. That's right. Schools should have been the priority. And you know what that meant? Every school should have had a rapid test before they ever were forced to open. Everybody in your community should wear a mask for at least six weeks solid before we open the school. Everybody in the state should shut down if that needs to be to stop the virus so schools don't have the virus. If that's really a priority, we could have made it a priority. And that should have been the priority. Why on earth would we open a school that didn't have a rapid test? And I realize they're not perfect. I realize, but you know what? It's better than what we have, isn't it? And how much more confidence would your teachers have if once a week, all the kids in their class were tested? And it would also help community spread. It would help people in the community know. If that's really was our priority, we could have done that. 
And somebody asked me the other day about vaccines and I said, we'll know what leadership we have in the country, what leadership we have in our state, if teachers get the vaccine before professional athletes get the vaccine. And if they don't, that's a reminder of what really matters to the people who are making the decisions. And to me, teachers matter. And I like sports. I mean, you know, there's nobody yeah. that's a bigger sport. <laughs> yeah. so, but, but it doesn't matter. But, but teaching matters. And schools should have been the priority. And instead, what happens is we're making them a non-priority by just saying just open with no guidelines, no, no structure, no testing, no anything. It's just camp run amok. And that, that was a joke. And we could have had this. Come on. We could have had every school opening in August and September. And if we were behind on tests, maybe you can't open till October. But when you open, you're open. And how on earth that wasn't organized and a priority on, the, on a national level to me just shows a, a true lack of leadership that we've had. And, and school leaders have shown how it's done, but that's not a political statement, it's a leadership statement. Yeah, and that school should have been a priority. Oh, gosh, you know, Todd. Sorry. It's, it, it's sort of, you know, the thing I think that's funny, right now we're at the point where we sort of have vaccines coming why on earth doesn't the federal government pay Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca or whoever, whoever has it, why don't they pay them for the vaccine and give it to all the other companies free? So that everybody's making it as rapidly as possible. Hmm. And I'm, but it's not at the expense of, the, of let's say, I'm only choosing Pfizer because they've been in the news the most lately. Yep. Yep. Why, do, why don't we do that? And let's say Pfizer's gonna make, I, I'm making up a number, so please, let's say they're gonna make $5 billion out of it. Let's give them 5 billion and give the vaccine recipe to every other company. They've made their profit, but now we'd have them all by New Year's. And I, I don't understand stuff like that. That's, that's the, that's, but, but I, I'm, because you can't just take it from Pfizer. I, I understand that, but we've given away so many money. You know, we've given 75 billion to airlines. And you know what's funny? If we had a vaccine, you wouldn't need to give money to airlines. Uh, great point. Yep. Yep. Um, so, and I'm an airline fan. I mean, <laughs> I got <laughs> yeah. all these points. I don't want them shutting down. <laughs> but, but it's just the prioritizing of what we do. And what's strange is when you explain it this way, you don't get pushback. I don't get pushback on why I want you to wear a mask for my mom. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what leadership is. And school leaders have done such a marvelous job around this. And obviously the frontline teachers have too. It's just incredible. And I just want you to take care of yourselves because we need you. You really are essential and not in that definition. You're really essential and we need you. And I want to thank you for what you do every day. Ah, that's a great, they're just so such great. You're such a great just thinker and speaker. I, I mean, I can listen to you on a number of topics here. So I, I appreciate it, Todd. Um, uh, that was a great way to end. Um, you, you, I, you're act, you know, I always finish off with, you know, where can our listeners connect you with you online? Uh, you've got your, you've got your website, you're active on Twitter, um, fa uh, you're not, Facebook, Instagram, pretty much all the above. Is that correct? Or. Yeah, but it really, honestly, my website, toddwhitaker.com has my contact information, Twitter at Todd Whitaker. You can do the others, but I don't check them. I'm not as and I don't have any people, so it's just me. So if you want to DM me on Twitter or, or whatever, um, you know, I head to all states all over. I do Zoom stuff, and I'm not soliciting any of this stuff. I'm just saying. But also, if you just have a challenging parent, a challenging situation, and you just want a neutral outsider's opinion, call me or email me anytime you want to. It'll cost you the price of the phone call. Because what happens is I don't want you doing it wrong. Because if you do it wrong, you're weaker and they're stronger, and it's too much of a cost. And the other thing is when it comes to dealing with challenging and negative people, I'm different than other people. Most people want to resolve a situation. I want to change their behavior forever. And that's a very different goal. And because of that, I don't have to be in a hurry. Mm -hmm. You know, in your school, the worst teacher has been tolerated for 19 years. What's another month? While you're figuring out how to change them forever. So what's another month? And instead, all we do is we just band-aid stuff all the time. We just try to resolve it and make this one parent happy by doing something, even though then the same dysfunctional is going on. Or we make this one person happy. You know, the parent, it's the same way. I'm going to change the, that's more like when I use the example of telling the parent, you haven't put this on social media, have you? Because I'm afraid the other people won't like your daughter. I'm trying to change their behavior forever. 
it isn't about a post because I didn't even talk about a post. I'm talking about the future. I'm not talking about the past. And we spend so much time in the rearview mirror instead of the windshield that we can never really get things solved. It's like masking. You know, what's funny is I didn't care what the debate on mask was. I just wanted it to stop. I didn't need somebody to be right or wrong. And right now, since we've gone down to a 10 day incubation period, if we could mask for two weeks, really 100% of the country for two weeks, you'd, you'd be amazed how where we'd be at. Just be incredible. So, and the right, the, the right leaders can get that accomplished and the others can't. And I always say during time, everybody always looks to a leader, but during times of crisis, they stare. I think we need Whitaker for governor of Missouri. What do you oh, think? Oh, no, you can do better than that. <laughs> I'm almost sure that'll have a background check. That'll eliminate your right there. <laughs> uh, Todd, well, I, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll let you go on there. Um, you did not disappoint. I, I was excited. I was nervous for tonight. And you just, man, you just, you nailed it. You, it was just exactly what our audience was hoping to hear. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for um, just sharing your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it, Todd. And if anybody happens to hear this on there and wants to give a shout out on Twitter, I'd love to know. I'll always follow you. You can always unfollow me. I'll never know the difference. But I just love to connect with people who care and have a passion and are interested in education. So, and Iowa, to be honest, is one of the most progressive states in the country on Twitter. They're one of the leading states in the country in terms of educators on Twitter. So, um, and Twitter's the best free professional development I've ever seen. So take advantage of it. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Jared. Your district's, your district's lucky to have your leadership, let me tell you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. You have a good evening and uh, have, have a happy holidays. Okay. Sounds good. I'll, I head up Iowa way a lot. Maybe we can cross paths sometime. Oh, that'd be awesome. All okay. right. Thanks, man. Take care, everybody. Have a good holiday. Whenever this comes out, maybe it's <laughs> Arbor Day by then. I don't know. Oh, we're getting out. We're, I'm getting this out right away, man. This is, this is too good to, to hold back. Okay. Sounds good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks, man.